good morning everyone uh, this is ashwini from samvadhi research and uh, i am working as a deputy manager in the company and uh, today we have dr prathna saikya uh, for the session on uh, law and civil schedule uh, due today i will just walk you all through the session plan there is a slight change uh, with respect to the session plan that i have been shared with you all uh, and uh, i'll just <coughs> share what have been the changes uh, and uh, what we are going to uh, sort of what we are expecting out of the module and uh, what uh, you can expect from the module all those uh, conversations can happen later but uh, prior to that <coughs> after a very brief uh, introduction uh, with you all and with ma'am and uh, to the introduction with the module we move to the exploration of i'll just zoom it a little bit it should be brief on the does not require all this yeah so uh, we'll move to the exploration of tribal question which led to the passing of six schedule and uh, tribal question in the union of india uh, particularly before we break for the tea the first tea after the tea break we'll be uh, having a mock debate on the on constituent assembly Uh, which will explore the historical foundation of tribal autonomy so this mock debate is completely based on the debate that uh, it's it's an excerpt from the debate that occurred uh, with the founders of the six schedule jj m nicol roy and uh, other people uh, his parliamentarian colleagues and uh, and that will be shared it will be a, a group session and uh, we'll go through the conversations they went through then to trace the historical foundation of the six schedule and then uh, this will channelize into a discussion for the community identity and citizenship ki how uh, i'm sorry how uh, the idea of a citizen uh, the the difference and the convergent aspects of citizenship and nationality all those dimensions will be covered in this particular session and uh, it will be borrowing from various theories of justice uh, that have been proposed uh, in in our uh, political history not just our political history but also global political history the theory of justice which from which the citizenship uh, is borrowed and then adopted by different constitutions and states and then we will break in for lunch uh, after lunch we will begin with the uh, session second session for today that will be uh, focusing on uh, very uh, governance and administrative pertinent challenges this uh, this will be the part one of the discussion before the second tea break the in the part one of the discussion we will be uh, discussing very uh, administrative based uh, experiences coming from the participants as well as some of the cases ma'am have has personally gone through so uh, we get an idea of how the uh, governance and administrative frameworks are uh, i mean are uh, in in the current uh, uh, state framework of six schedule and then in the second session of the same discussion we'll be reflecting on the administrative potential uh, when i say what is uh, i mean when i say administrative potential what i particularly mean is that uh discussing uh, what are the what could be the possible solutions what are the current inefficiencies and what how can we uh, begin with policy driven uh, policy interventions to address those uh, gaps so this is the first uh, this is how the first day of the of the plan, uh, session looks like uh, completely based on the law and the six schedule and uh, i'll i'll hand over to ma'am to begin with the introduction of the module itself thank you <clears throat> so before that we have a introduction yeah, yeah. before we begin to move into the module shall i ask ha yeah they can start with us i can do that um, yeah so we can have a round of introduction yeah. okay. Don't 
Okay, um, all right. So I'm uh, Dr. Prathna Saikya. I teach at the School of Development Studies, TISS Mumbai. Uh, my background is anthropology. I'm, I'm trained as an anthropologist, and then my specialization is uh, in. Uh, I mean, as my research interest lies in the area of citizenship, uh, nationality, and then identity question. I completed my PhD from IIT Guwahati, uh, and my uh, my dissertation, my thesis was on citizenship, nationality, and uh, the political history of Assam since 1947. And um, that's briefly who I am. Um, so I would also uh, like to know who you are before we start the sessions. Uh, that will help me to, you know, uh, initiate the conversation. You know how we how we see it, right? So we shall begin from the wherever. <laughs> Please volunteer, ma'am. Maybe we can start with you. Sorry? Okay. Sorry? I'm Emin Sama, Silicon Minerals, Okay. Um, ma'am. Um, I, uh, the body of, uh, the body of, uh, the body of, 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 the body um, uh, you work with the welfare department. Okay. I'm Amy Kashandi, District Social Welfare Officer, East Khasi. I'm Tracy Young, I'm from the State Adoption Association. Okay. okay. Law Department of? Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry? Okay. 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 All right. So it's a mix of uh, research fellows and then um, in different administrative positions. So uh, we'll have a, we'll try to have a, a hybrid kind of a conversation. I mean, hybrid in a sense that it is not, uh, it will not be just about the policies and uh, policy interventions, but it will be also about the ideological and philosophical debates. Uh, I, I, as we we have now, uh, you know, uh, got the introductions, and people are from the the law background. So here, uh, as I imagine it, as uh, and also please, uh, you feel free to intervene. What your expectations are, and uh, what I see here is the, um, I mean, the role of myself as a as a as a social scientist. So I'll I'll try to. Uh, bring in the understandings from the social sciences. Basically, try we'll try to connect the, the understandings from the law and from the administration and policy uh, interventions. Right, so that will be the bridge, as I can see it uh, from the basic imagination. So, I I'd like to have some some reflections for you as well. You can you can speak it up up at any point uh, while having the conversation and. Um, uh, Ma'am, maybe we can have your uh, introduction because we have completed the a round of introduction. We are left. Yeah. Hello, I'm Nishita. I'm a this year's PSM fellow in the Department of Law. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, and for the for the resource scholars who are here from the law, uh, I my my request is that you know it's a very different kind of a understanding that we come from the social scientists and law background and then the administrative uh, thing so i would uh, request you to also um, you know specify your 
your resource and in uh, areas I mean, in what areas you're working so maybe we can have one other round of introduction uh, with your research interest of what area you're working in especially the law which area you're working in if i can know yeah you you also from the law department yeah, so yeah. No, I'm, I'm you're a research scholar right no no i'm a lawyer but i'm working for the department right so uh, which area are you working we are working for child protection all right protection. okay your yeah. I was doing my BLB honors in criminal law, then uh, master's in human rights, my PhD is on tribal laws. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah, so uh, basically I'm a public policy student, done my master's uh, in public policy. So my area of interest lies in, in the intersection of health, uh, of policy, and law. Because uh, uh, Grimani is a sexual industry, right? Mm -hmm. It comes with its own set of um, let's say complexities, but a lot of challenges associated with any sector of challenges, like right? let's say health, education, or whatever. I get challenge comes with section. So, how a uh, like policy intervention should be taken care of while understanding the uh, intricacies of uh, uh, section? So, my field of interest, uh, research lies mostly. Uh, All right, yeah. Uh, I specialize in constitutional law, and also, um, then after I graduated from uh, when I was in school, I was working on such a Okay, uh, that's it. I think. Yeah. I think you are. Um, I graduated with BA in economics, and my area of interest is the right-hand system of Mihari, like special defense of Imam Okra. Okay. Um, and yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. I'm, 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 I have a I'm a master's in law. Right now, at an MSI, we are setting up a CNB Meghalaya. We are setting up a school of traditional Indigenous studies. So, we are working on those six to the Kabul Ramusham works and the Kabul Ramusham works. That's all we are So, in this year, uh, we have. So the indigenous study department. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. <coughs> Great. Um, <coughs> so shall we again back for the yes, no. introduction? We'll start. Yeah. Okay. How oh, we can move to the travel question. Yeah, the PPT. Yeah. Uh, so as uh, the Ashwin has said, and now I have a sense of uh, the the research uh, scholars because it's a very as I'm uh, as I have uh, you know I am trying to have a sense that what we really need to do here. So that's why I have asked about the research interest and then where you have already you know where you are already working in. The administrative officers who are uh, directly engaged in the policy, uh, you know, uh, implementation and then framing of the policies, they do not. I mean, they 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 already they're in the expertise in the in the area of understanding how the policy work and then what are the challenges of you know uh, fulfill the goal of the policy. Uh, but then um, for the resource scholars, I mean, I'm not making a difference, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand that where we you know, come together. So for the, for the challenges in terms of the resource scholars, as the many of you have said, uh, so you, are, you are already kind of having an, uh, trying to have an understanding of how the existing policy in a, in a uh, state like Meghalaya, which is under the sixth schedule, uh, are it are at play so you know there's a there's already kind of a critical engagement at uh, when it's it is done in the level of the research so it is it is always try to understand then what would, what would be the future challenges and already the the historical challenges that we have come up so what i see here as a gap is that from my own research interest and then uh, from my own research is uh, that that uh, you know often we lack the knowledge of the history, which is very, very crucial uh, in both these aspects. When we go for a research in, in any sort of, you know, policy making or examination of the policy, whether they're doing well or not, 
but and also when we are trying to frame a policy to address certain uh, questions of the of the inclusion exclusion in the society or how the law is functioning how the laws are at play then we lack this whole knowledge of you know uh, you know history that's a very very significant uh, you know development or significant you know challenges that we have been facing so as a social scientist what we do and for instance from my own discipline the uh, my my discipline is anthropology but then uh, when i try to engage with uh, this whole uh, lot of how the state you know function and then how it 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 how the policies and other sorts of interventions uh, the the welfare schemes uh, comes at at you know uh, at the you know they come come into the level of the local level and then how it how they work how they function then we are uh, the the anthropologist the job of the anthropologist is to go to the field to the local level and then do a very uh, detailed ethnographic uh, you know study that how uh, and then it is it is of course uh, it is a community perspective that anthropology brings in. So that is how it is. So this is the model, the first model, which is the tribal question in the Union of India and the six schedule is going to draw a lot from this perspective, the anthropological perspective and also the historical perspective. As I said, that this is, I feel, and I, this is, this has been the experience of last 10 years of, you know, teaching and the research experiences that I had gathered. We have observed that, uh, the historical consciousness is so much crucial to understand the present day problem, both in the in the policy implementation and also in the policy research. So uh, I will I'll try to give a very uh, you know uh, these are very basic points which are in the PPT, but we'll try to have a conversation on based of the, that. And I'm, I'm sure that I do not need to enlighten you on the on the points. I mean these are the factual points which are there in the PPT. But I'll try to you know uh, initiate a conversation, and I'll also I like to hope to have your participation here. So. Um, uh, because the conversation will help to, you know, uh, what we need to have uh, discussed here, right? Yeah. Uh, so as I said that uh, my area of interest is, uh, the research interest is identity, the whole question of identity. So how, how I imagine it, I mean, how the social scientists have been imagining the whole question of identity, which is very much connected to the question of citizenship and nationality that will have a separate session. Uh, but the, at the beginning, let me just tell you that, you know, the question of identity is philosophically, it is, there are two ways of looking at the whole question of identity. The first is the question of identity sprouts from the very understanding of the self, the consciousness about the self, who I am, and who you are, the other, around the uh, around the, that self, the consciousness of the self. But it is there's another uh, another philosophical understanding of the self is that identity, not self, but identity, is always given by the other. I mean, it is it is a, it is not the identity of myself which is which sprouts from this the the idea of self, but it is actually the identity which is given by the other. So where is this problem? Uh, where is this proposition uh, is in is is important to uh, to this particular conversation? This this is important that uh, because of the fact that when whenever we are talking about whenever we talk about, for instance, uh, the whole question of six schedule, why we we have a six schedule? Uh, within the larger constitutional framework of universal we. Universal we, which the Indian constitution proposes, it is a, it is a consensus, it is a, it is a identity. Uh, when we, when, when we think of the, the identity of that we, it is a, it is a, it is a communal understanding. I mean, it is a community understanding, which is, which includes all the people of Union of India. But then, why we have a separate administrative you know uh, mechanism in 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 a state like meghalaya it's a simple question why so that that sense of identity of 
Uh, I mean, that's that's a that's a separate set of we in in the larger universal we. And then the second point is that we need to examine various others in this everyday life and in different social and cultural contexts. So that brings in the, the context here that in the larger universal we, we, there are different social and cultural contexts which need to be protected. So whole notion of the protection comes in. We'll move ahead with this idea, you know, later. And uh, that context in the new nation state, which is the Union of India, to engage further with the question of identity, bringing into the plain question of nationality, citizenship, etc. So a very, very personalized experience of uh, understanding of I, the self, how it goes to the expands to the larger question of uh, I in the in the uh, nation state, in the new nation state, which brings in the questions of citizenship and nationality and ethnicity, etc. And uh, why does anthropological investigation of self and then other is important in this in this particular context? It is very much important in a particular context because anthropology as a discipline had started the whole question of understanding or studying the others. Uh, I do not know whether I'm, I'm sure that many of you are aware of this, how anthropology started. Uh, but then how the study of anthropology, I mean, what anthropology started studying at the beginning? What was the subject matter of the discipline called anthropology? But anthropology was one of the primary discipline that engaged with this question of other. Uh, and then, of course, the, as I have already mentioned that how anthropological engagement here is very, very uh, important is that anthropology goes to the field and then try to understand and what is happening in the local level. For instance, we frame a policy in, uh, in, in Meghalaya, in the case of Meghalaya, if you are framing the policy in Shillong, we do not know how it is functioning in Nongo, for instance. So how do you know a person sitting, a policy maker who is sitting here and then uh, framing the policy, of course, drawing from different reflections, different you know inputs, different informations, how that person is going to uh, have an understanding that how the policy is working at, at the local level. That can be done with the, with the intervention in the field, the reflections from the field, and which is a very, very primary subject matter of anthropology. They go to the field, they study, they engage with the other, quote unquote, and then try to have a very thorough understanding of what is happening in the local level. So in that sense, anthropological investi uh, investigation or anthropology, the reflections from the field, which is again called ethnography, is very much crucial for this, this conversation we are having. Yeah. Uh, so again, the whole question of other, you know, now, now let us have some understanding of the, how the, as I said, that the historical consensus is too, too crucial to, to go ahead with this conversation. So these are the informations that uh, uh, that that's already there, and I'm sure that many of you have already you know you know. So how this uh, how I'm trying to understand uh, connect the whole philosophical uh, understanding uh, from the discipline of anthropology, and then connect to the policy interventions in India, tribal policies uh, in the colonial time, and then also uh, you know we'll come to the present day uh, context also. But then how it is, how I'm going to connect is that the whole gauge of, the whole colonial gauge of tribal people, tribal, who is a tribe? You know, that's a very big question in Indian context and both the academicians, uh, the policy makers, the, uh, the researchers, they have been constantly engaging with the idea which is called uh, uh, the tribal. Who, who is a tribe? I mean, this whole connotation this whole idea, this identity of tribe is actually it's a given identity, which I said that in the beginning that who is self, that it sprouts from I, a sense of me and you are the other, I'm the I and then you are the other. But in a contrary, here, the whole colonial gauge had given the idea to the all, to most of the, to all the community, tribal community people that you are the tribe. The whole question of Adivasi, maybe in an Adivasi or a tribal person had never asked this question that whether I'm tribal or I'm, who am I? 
This question is very personal at that level, which is again political at one sense. But then at the arrival of the, the colonial you know, rulers, when the, uh, when, the, uh, when the people from the Western societies had come, it is always a gauge for the other. They had identified, they had started seeing people other than them, which are very different, the culturally different, the way they uh, you know, live their life is very different. So it is it is an immediate reaction reaction to that confrontation that you know they, they have encountered a completely different kind of a social, cultural, and uh, economical situation here. So how do they understand? So these these seeing is again again that was a problem of the discipline of anthropology, is that the anthropologist of uh, of this particular period, I mean, 18th century and 19th century anthropologists, they had always traveled to the remote areas of different across the globe and tried to study the other. And then mostly it is said that, you know, they try to, uh, anthropologists were engaged with the primitive societies. Again, another very interesting term which comes in at play is a primitive. What is, what is primitive again? Primitive is like in the in the in the course of human evolution, the one who had uh, who had been uh, who, who who had never developed the, uh, with the same pace of the others. Who are, uh, the other here is the Western uh, you know societies. So they had started ident identifying the other societies who did not develop at the pace or the way they did, uh, they kind of evolved in the in the course of human evolution they termed them that as primitive and they, they thought there are a lot of theoretical you know understanding in anthropology we're not going into that because that will uh, take a lot of time but then there are different proposals to it also so they would say that you know this is they were at different stage of evolution for instance, they were closer to the to the uh, to the primitive world, where the uh, where the civilization was not happening; it did not take place. So there was a lot of you know problematic ideas. For instance, Sanskritization, civilizational approaches that had that they, and they they had been uh, criticized by uh, by different you know anthropologists again, other sociologists you know later, other social sciences uh, you know scholars. But but it it was a very important point of you know identifying or understand to have an understanding of the other and where the anthropologist played a very very significant role and why it was that in the case of India let us coming back to this this particular context in the case of the colonial uh, period the laws the policies the tribal policies during the colonial uh, period uh, in in India. It was actually assisted by a lot of anthropological understanding. And very interestingly, a lot of administrative officers in the colonial government, they did a lot of expeditions, and especially in the northeastern you know, region. Uh, there are a lot of expeditions to Arunachal Pradesh. There were a lot of ex uh, present day Arunachal Pradesh. There were a lot of expeditions to Nagaland. For instance, the whole idea of the headhunter, uh, head, headhunting Naga is actually identified and given by the such administrative officers who kind of encountered them, who met them at a very interesting you know, point of administrative interventions. And then they, they had given those, you know, uh, those tags, those, those ideas of the ident identities to the, to the others. And uh, during that period, uh, when the policy, I mean, the, and then, the, the colonial government was communicated and the colonial government themselves had learned that there is different people who are very much different from us, who are very much, uh, you know, who, who live a very different kind of a life than the Western everyday life. They need to have some different sort of administrative policies. They cannot be governed the way the others, then the then the primitive people or the tribal people were being governed. So they tried a lot of, there are a lot of expeditions and interventions like for instance, uh, they, uh, the, the colonial government, they started uh, deputing the, the army officials near the, uh, the tribal settlement areas. And then there were a lot of conflicting situations uh, there. The tribals, the quote unquote tribal people, 
which were not yet to be which were yet to be termed as the tribes of india they had a lot of you know problematic conflicting encounter with these uh, these uh, army personnel and then with that so uh, and uh, another important point here which i just uh, forgot to include is that with this difference the proposal for the different set of administration or different set of governance this whole policy of segregation the idea of isolation came uh so are you a, are any one of you are you aware of the the basic principles of uh, tribal administration in india what are the philosophical domains uh maybe the research scholars could answer i mean isolation being the one and what are the other ideas any idea no okay so uh th there's a first policy which is uh, which is the isolation the policy of isolation i mean a different sort of policy were framed and at the and before that it was tried that the tribal people who were different than the others should be kept in isolation so that is the idea of isolation that the whole policy framework uh, around the the question of tribe started that's the initial the first form of uh, you know idea uh, the idea of isolation was the that is a colonial you know uh, 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 idea to uh, start with so that uh, and from that idea of isolation came the policy of segregation so how it came uh in the and at the question the another question this whole idea of isolation is again it is it is very interesting it is it is of course given by the by the britishers but at the same time it is also uh because of the fact that the quote unquote the adivasi the tribe or the tribal people they used to have a very separate and secluded you know uh, inhabiting uh, areas they do not live uh, near to the quote unquote the populated uh, comparatively quote unquote civilized uh, you know people so they would live in a isolated areas because they are the in most of the time uh, the forest they would be the forest dwellers they will live deep in the forest so this also had uh, contributed to this whole idea of isolation that they already live in isolation they do not interact mass uh, much with the uh, the quote unquote the mainstream you know society or the other the major majority society majoritarian society which is easier to understand in terms of for instance uh, the the uh, the tri uh, the uh, when the, the colonial uh, government they set up the cities like kolkata it was it was easier for them bengal uh, at that point was of course an undivided bengal i mean including the east and then west bengal it was very easier for them to understand the the caste dynamics i mean it is not very easy but yet it was easier for them because the, they had a very uh, everyday kind of a conversation with the people who were participating in the administrative uh, you know system but it in bengal itself there's a whole lot of tribal population which was very difficult for the british uh, administration to understand how to administer them so this question came up with this uh, this whole question of that they leave the first, first fact is that they leave in isolation and then second fact is that they're different from the others so that's where the whole idea of isolation and then pol uh, came and then policy of segregation started but then this is again the outcome of the british policy and administration was considerable discontent among the tribal communities as i said that they were agitating and then there were lot of revolt happened <coughs> so uh, the tribal the quote unquote tribal and an adivasi people started revolting i mean it was that they were not quite okay with the guarding you know that the the uh, for instance that uh, the army personnel who were uh, deputed to have a control or have a you know uh, uh, some kind of uh, security dot but that is that is security in terms of the uh, for the british administration rather than the tribal uh, people or uh, gave them a sense of restriction and the two important thing here is that the right to land the whole land question and the forest question comes in so now when 
you have a people i mean it's it's a very simple thing that when i'm at my home and then this is my i have a sense of territory that i live in this particular space when someone else who is other for me comes in and then set some security guard for me then then you know the idea is like we'll keep you safe the promise is that we will keep you safe but that is not the fact it also uh it is it, it is very disturbing for the sense of the identity or the sense that i have for myself and my territory that it is it is kind of you know though i'm given the uh the freedom or liberty to have my own space but then around that space there is a surveillance so this whole sense of surveillance which is very much alien to the to the tribal people who who had been living in isolation for 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 years for decades for centuries they did not like it so there are a lot of revolt uh, revolt in central india so these are the revolts uh, for just for the information but again this is this is very basic and um this the following that the santhal revolt specifically in 1855 the special administrative uh, stipulations for the affected areas known as the indian council act came into existence in 1861 when you move ahead with the other uh, you know uh, sessions we'll be discussing about uh, the question of whole question of social justice uh, or or for that matter the idea of justice so here the whole question of the idea of justice also makes a, a very interesting reference so i'll just mention it is that why it is why this need of direct policy intervention in india uh came into play i mean why the britishers thought that we need a separate set of policy to govern these people this is of course as a result of the revolts as i had mentioned and it was specifically about the santhal revolt in 1855 <clears throat> now the question is that this is again a very interesting uh, intervention by the <coughs> colonial government but why did they un- why did it thought that that could be the solution uh, to these such kind of revolt because the western philosophy thinks that justice is given through or it is an uh, it it expresses its, itself through revolt <coughs> through uh, through agitations through protest so this is a protest that and then the this a, with the with that uh the philosophical you know understanding the western administrators thought that it it would be easier for us first of all it was for the convenience of the colonial government no doubt about it but in a larger philosophical level it was also understood that whenever there is a revolt the the response to it if if there is a sense of justice associated with it of course it is then it is the response to it is a policy intervention so we'll bring in this point in the in the later discussion when we discuss in great details about the justice but then this is a very significant point that we started having tribal policies the colonial government initiated to have a separate set of tribal policy and of course it had a very interesting reference with the carnavalis uh land reform acts i mean these are this is also associated very closely associated with the bengal's zamindari system and the land reform acts uh, the whole question the tribal question is when it is now i mean it's a popular reference uh, in social sciences is that we call that sons of the soil the bhumi putra andolan why it is the soil the whole component of land is so central to uh, to the question of tribe in india is that the policy interventions in fact started with that the land reforms so they had they, uh, they had different set of policies here it, it the whole slide talks about it i'm not going to uh, you know uh, talk uh, read it from here but then what is important for us to in this uh, in the context of today's conversation is that they started having the government of india act 1919 they did not change the policy of isolation towards tribals uh, you know the if you can remember we have just mentioned that it of course did not challenge that the the fact that the thought that they have to live in isolation 
But then what did they do is that they create in different zones. For instance, the wholly secluded areas. Their mixer, their uh, present in Northeast India makes a very interesting reference. The areas totally excluded from the purview of the British laws. So it is apparently the British administrators never had a control in those areas. It's a wholly secluded area. And uh, not as frontier tracks, which was, uh, which was Nefa, which is actually present in Arunachal Pradesh. And the um, tracks of Naga Hills and then Lusai Hills, which is the Mijaram, uh, present in Mijaram. In the, these areas were the completely, wholly excluded areas. So British government administration never had this, uh, had any control over these areas. And then there were areas which are personally excluded areas. So they were, uh, they are also called personally secluded areas. Uh, areas particularly in other states, for instance, uh, Bihar, Bengal, Urissa, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra and Madras. Madras is you know, the old uh, province of Madras. And then after that, there were some amendments with the arrival of the 1933 uh, Government of India Act. So they demarcated the tribal areas at, at, as excluded areas and partially excluded areas, which were beyond the purview of the federal and provincial legislations. So here again, it becomes partially few areas where it, they redesigned the areas. I mean, we drew the boundary of these areas and then they introduced a, some partial, some interventions in certain areas, but not, but uh, still the wholly excluded areas uh, continue to exist. And um, the legislative law uh, could be applied in, in those areas, according to 1933 uh, Government of India Act. Legislative law could be applied to those areas only at the direction of the governor. So here, comes, I mean, those who, I mean, of course, uh, most of us, many of us, I mean, all of us, we are aware of the, how the six schedule, uh, how in the six schedule states and then six schedule areas, governor plays a very important role. So this, uh, this particular amendment is very, very crucial because it had, it started giving that, that particular role or status to the governor. It excluded, uh, in excluded areas and other areas, the governor acts on the advice of the council of minister. So again, we can, I mean, we can relate with the present day context that how the council minister uh, members, uh, I mean, they, they, they work very directly with the, in, in direct relation with the governor and then execute these policies. So this is actually drawn from the colonial, you know, uh, policies. Uh, which were made during the, the I mean, uh, the British rule. Very interesting. I mean, the, the structure is actually almost the same. So then what happened when we had a regime change? You know, we got independence. So now we are, suddenly we are a different uh, nation state. Uh, very interestingly, it is not just India. After World War II, of course, the colonial, I mean, the whole question of, exploitative colonial government faced a lot of criticism and it was it was inevitable that the colonies had to go it was not just the independence the war of independence it is not just about the war of independence but of course uh, the whole whole question of it is a it's an international scenario of that point of time after world war ii when the human right the question of human right uh, equality, justice and fraternity, especially after the French Revolution came at play, Europe was enlightened with a new wave of enlightenment, then the colonies were inevitable. I mean, they had to go. Unlike uh, like India, the, the countries like South Africa, India, the new nation states, when they got independence, it is not just a specific case of India. It is same with the South, the countries like South Africa or the other colonies who got decolonized at that point of time after World War II, they actually continued with the colonial <coughs> laws, ideologically and philosophically. There was not much difference. I mean, theory of isolation, it was done by the, or the whole policy of segregation, it was done by the, by the colonial government, as I said, 
it was actually an imposed or given identity by the british who came from the western world who had no idea about the indian society it was given by the others but then what what happened when the people of india they started ruling themselves so now it is it is not the other but it is the self which is ruling the self rule as as gandhi would call the self the swaraj the swaraj at play but how it it works will it's very interesting to see see back that we didn't do much change to the policy and there comes the gap when we talk of the uh, the capacity building of uh, of the administrative officers or the the people or the workers who are trying to implement the policies at the local level this is a very big challenge that policies are there of course there are lot of philosophical uh, you know evolution which happened over the course of time and the policies changes and that also reflects when the, the local reflects at the policy level it there is no doubt about it but then how it is done it is through the implement the the, the ones who implement it it is not uh not directly by the one who actually design it design when it comes to designing a policy it is actually the the thinkers and and there in that level the the philosophical intervention is very important very crucial but then very interestingly it is very important to have a fair idea of those philosophical shifts or the ideological shifts for the the people who are So yeah that is that's the thing they were trying to have a control but then they were not being able to have a control because for instance a case of north east india uh arunachal and uh, nagaland specifically it was so difficult for the for the administ i mean the britishers to reach into those areas geographically it's very challenging so meghalaya was uh, one of the i mean present day meghalaya was comparatively easier terrain so they they settled here they started the whole colonization process from here but when it is a difficult geographical terrain it's very you know they 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 could not control it and on top of that it was very there's a very interesting account uh, specially for the uh, for the introduction of tea cultivation in assam there's a i mean that's a very uh, very much related with what you are asking uh when they were looking for the laborers to uh, work in uh, work for the cleaning of the area and to prepare it for the uh, tea cultivation in the present day uh, eastern assam uh they were looking for laborers specifically the tribal laborers and then they thought that they could exploit and then you know uh they can make them work uh the, the valley people of assam that at uh, that point of time assam i mean it's undivided assam of course uh they were very lazy I and mean, they were known as the lazy natives so they started hunting uh, for the tribal people and very interestingly they would hunt some naga uh, people from the from the nagaland present in nagaland area and they will depute them to clean the jungle and then uh, prepare for the uh, tea garden and then interestingly they would work for some days some nights and then they will vanish so they will go into the forest and it was impossible it was literally impossible there were a lot of very interesting <coughs> um, accounts of the by the british administrative officers uh, they wrote that you know it was impossible for them to locate them once they go into the forest first of all they cannot go into the forest they do not know the geography of the region and secondly the natives the the naga people for instance uh, they they are very you know uh, they know the terrain so it was very difficult for them to uh, administer to have a control over them control over their movement and then make them work and in a way exploit them so they had to bring people from china there are a lot of villages in assam even the present day assam uh there are villages like sinatuli in eastern assam it is a actually a chinese settlement and then they came these people came from china uh, were brought from china to work in the tea garden uh you know areas 
So this is an example from Northis itself uh, that, you know, it was, it was not very easy to administer, to have a control over the quote unquote tribal people. So that is, of course, one of the major reasons that they tried to gird the area around. Uh, there is also a parallel uh, historical perspective that uh, even uh, during the colonial times, uh, in 1765 when Robert Clive was being brought, he, uh, he was being uh, allowed to supervise all the laws in the tribal areas, uh. especially in the Garo areas, in the Khasi areas, all the areas. So uh, they couldn't, uh, they were allowed to collect taxes mm. and uh, this responsibility was given to the Jamindars or the tribal areas. Mm. But they couldn't collect the taxes due to which they were suffering. Not the Jamindars, the, the tax collectors. Tax collectors, yeah. uh, but uh, it's within the Jamindars. Like, like, no, no, no there, it's a different system. It was a right to system. We never had a uh, Jamindari yeah. system. But uh, they were, uh, the tax collectors were being allowed to collect the taxes, but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't go to those areas and collect taxes, mm. due to which the, they couldn't earn their revenues. That is the reason they turned this isolated. Uh, and the first legislation which was being brought was Garo Beast Act 1869, yeah. through which they started they, you know, isolating all those areas and turning it isolated areas. Yes, no, that yeah, that's what actually the, the the example that I had given it is it is actually complementing the other. I mean, this is the direct policy example from North East India, but in Central India, for instance, there's a there's a dense forage for which they could never access had access to. So then, but then they were very much aware. I mean, they this knowledge was with them that these areas are very very rich in terms of uh, forest resources. So it, it is not always like that. They, they would mark the areas, uh, isolation, isolated area, I mean, excluded area, and then they would do nothing. They always tried to penetrate. So that's why the 1933 uh, amendment was there, that, you know, they, they started partially excluded areas. So that penetration or the expansion was happening, no doubt. It's not like that they mar marketed the area and then they left it like that. It's not like that. They had always tried to exploit as much as possible. Uh, but yeah, that's that's one major reason uh, for coming up with this isolation. But philosophically, this whole question of isolation has something to do with the protection that we'll we'll talk now because it continued with the with the after independence and why it continued. So the major uh, idea of when the self rule, the Suraj started. Now we are the administrators who would administer ourselves so it is not the others who are going to rule us rule over us so now but then why uh, government of india after 1950 after uh, the constitution was kind of uh, adopted why we continued with the whole idea of isolation that is one of the major question that it is not the it is not the fact that the, the government of India, the self rulers, they did not uh, want to. I mean, they did not want to bring the the people who were in isolated areas under the direct control of the Union of India. But the fact that it was a in a philosophical level, it was a question of protection. So now it is a there is a shift. It is not, I mean, ideologically, it is not to exploit. It is not to intervene. It is not to rule over, to have a control. But it is about protection, how we protect. And with that, the whole question of, uh, I mean, the present day, uh, the schedule areas is also that the reflection is that. I mean, it reflects in the schedule areas because there is a call by the natives that we need protection, which comes under, for instance, in a, in a recent, very recent, in 2019, when the CAB came, uh, CAB was proposed and then there were all sorts of, you know, the various forms of resistance, particularly in North East India. Why this question came? We'll talk about it in great details in the second uh, session. But then um, this, this was because of the whole concern that we need to protect our culture or we need to protect in one sentence, we can say that we need to protect the different ways of livelihood, how we live. 
the everyday life of the quote unquote tribal people was very unique, was very different. So now the difference had brought in the whole question of a sense of insecurity, of course, that the new nation state, which is, of course, the replica or mirror of the Western uh, model. Uh, now we need a protection from that. So we need to have our own, uh, you know, kind of a area, territory, the whole sense of territory here uh, makes a very important, uh, you know, point. And then now we, we even with the new government, which is the self-rule again, but then we expect to have a special, you know, uh, protection. So now the government of India continued with this um, uh, whole concept of uh, isolation, uh, larger ideology of isolation. And it was a very rare Elwin, uh, many, most of us we know, I'm sure that recommended this national park, the idea of national park. And actually government of India worked on it. I mean, they almost kind of, uh, executed it but then it immediately uh, you know faced a lot of criticism that whole national park which is a Jew the whole I mean it's very discriminatory and then uh, it is it is beyond the the objective and very scientific understanding of the universal we which the uh, the Ambedkar you know intended to implement and have you know kind of uh, make it through the constitution so it was it was very much, you know, criticized. So government of India had to immediately respond to it. So, but then, but first policy was ideology, which the the present, I mean, the government of union of government also continued is that the idea of isolation. So national park was actually experimented. Uh, but then the constituent assembly, isolate uh, uh, very interestingly. The isolation question also expands to the proposals of schedule areas, 6th schedule and then 5th schedule both. So this, the though government of India had to respond to the criticisms, but then they had also continued with the, this idea of isolation, of course, with the larger interest of the protection, as I have said. So the constituent assembly also recommended the isolation of the same areas as tribal and then schedule areas. And the government machinery remained confined to schedule area and tribals living outside the area were not duly protected. I mean, it is it is a different sort of a different kind of protection, as I said. It was the mechanism was completely different. And constitutional safeguards, that's a very important point. Constitutional safeguards and the inclusion of the tribes of in the fifth schedule created, as I have mentioned, and then sixth schedule also came into play. And then the fibers plans. Uh, the whole model of welfare state also treated the tribal very differently. So they had different plans for the for the tribal areas, the excluded areas and the other areas. And then following the criticism, but then again, the as I said, the shift, government of India had to make a shift. So they made a shift to the policy of assimilation. So it is not just a policy of isolation now. So there's a new model which was proposed. It is a proposed and it was a, uh, a policy of isolation. I mean, the idea of, sorry, idea of assimilation. So it's like, let the, uh, let the people who live in excluded areas or <coughs> virtually excluded areas, I mean, in the schedule areas, let them also have a conversation or some sort of connection with the larger society. And the assimilation was the idea. We need to stop. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so we are at the point uh, of assimilation. I mean, um, after independence, when the whole uh, idea shifted towards a proposal to assimilation because of the criticism with the isolation part, uh, we already have that. So we can continue. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so what is assimilation? What is the difference between uh, this uh, isolation, the policy of isolation, and assimilation? So there is. Uh, the the primary principle, as I have already mentioned, it is about that the fact that it should not be uh, that that tribal area should not be completely secluded. There should be some sort of conversation or communication with the uh, the others around the tribal uh, you know societies. So that is a major point of assimilation. But then assimilation also faced severe criticism immediately after its implementation. Why so? 
it is a apparently it's a uh, i mean if if you if we think in terms of um, uh, to have a integrated a new india uh, indian nation and state uh, it should be a very welcoming it should have been a very welcoming uh, step as an idea and also as a policy intervention but why it faced the criticism we all know what is assimilation can anyone please help me what is assimilation i mean the the very meaning of the word maybe we can draw from no integration is different and again there is another policy intervention which is again based on the principle of integration so there is a very interesting difference between integration and assimilation so but what is the what is the idea behind assimilation i mean what does the word means what is assimilation so, to streamline with the mainland to streamline yeah with the, with the mainland yes with the people in the mainland yeah yeah It's like a conformist ideology. Conform to one particular set of identities instead of having many identities. So, simply, is it mixing up? No. What is it? It's more it's like assimilation with the mainland. Yeah. 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 Ye
you know, it, it faced a lot of criticism. So it, uh, India, I mean, the government had to shift the entire policy. Why it is so? So it is a different context altogether in the context of the evolutionary perspective of the, uh, the policy, tribal policies. So please keep it in mind and then try to reflect that really have, but this is, this is what I got. I mean, maybe this could be another way of uh, thinking in the present day context, which you are trying to think, but then uh, again, we have problem with the, for instance, if the quote unquote, the mainland India thinks that Hindi could be the Rashtra Vasha, which is not, uh, then, then the problems is that, as I said, that which is not actually. So the southern states, uh, the eastern states, uh, the northeastern states, we speak, we do use Hindi, uh, but then we do not speak, we do not know. For instance, my mother doesn't know Hindi, you know, she doesn't speak Hindi. So then uh, for her, it can't be Rashtrabhasha. So there's a problem with the, that notion of assimilation. And the other problem with the notion of assimilation is that which ma'am also uh, said in the new complimented her uh, reflection, is that when there's a sense of protection, that you, we, we would be protecting our culture, tradition, and uh, the identity, but then we'll also try to uh, bring into the, have a connection with the mainland, again, kind of showcasing our, our uh, you know, uh, culture, our identity, our ethnicity, but then, uh, why the whole question of, for instance, the schedule areas, then why do we need the protection? You are communicating with us. I mean, we are not, uh, why it is always, I mean, it is already perceived, you have already perceived us as, the, as, a, uh, as a possible threat to your identity. You are maintaining that gap, which you said. Uh, and then you're, you're protecting your culture at the same time. So you're protecting from whom? If you are show, uh, showcasing, you are trying to have a, some sort of connection with us, then why that, that gap is needed? Are we kind of harmful? This question from the mainland could be raised. So that sort of uh, notion of assimilation is also problematic. But that is not the context of what we are trying to, uh, and the context is a little different. We'll come to this point again, but yeah, before uh, that. My notion is totally different. Hmm. It means uh, like uh, focus is like totally uh, eroding all the culture. Yeah. And trying to uh, like uh, focus on a mainstream culture. Thank you so much. Yeah. So two things, like you will discuss the policy of assimilation that the, uh, yeah. In the post-independent India, it came. So that is a specific context. And uh, I would like uh, to orient the entire session into that part. So we'll, we'll discuss that. But like the Shah was saying, and like the different notions of assimilation are coming across. And there is, uh, we know that that policy of assimilation faced a lot of criticism. Any notion of assimilation and definition of assimilation that comes now, that will also have one uh, or two criticisms against it mm -hmm. and it will be struck down, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, once you discuss the policy of assimilation, I would like to know if we, if it is possible to come up with a certain notion of assimilation, uh, which can be beyond criticism, which, which cannot face any criticism. Yes, yes, right? of course. That could be the task of the session. Yeah, Maybe we can think of some model of uh, let's not call it assimilation because again yeah. we have the another policy intervention which is on the principle of integration. integration. But then uh, I think um, uh, uh, Pulak, right? Uh, he is in the very much into he he spoke in the context. So uh, just after that maybe we can. Uh, that, that one thing. Yeah. And the second thing, like I would like this is a request from my personal end to all the participants, and I'll tell you why it is a personal request. So. Uh, in academia, in also administrative purposes, we come across uh, policies and other documents where we refer to the large part of India as mainland India, which is like not northeast India, and then there is northeast India that we don't refer to in with any uh, unifying name, but we say northeast India, right? Because that is a directional geographical notion attached to it. So this is northeast India, but this does not have the baggage of a direction or a geography. It is mainland India. So I am a mainlander. I come from Delhi and my all my roots is in that, you know, quote unquote mainland. So I have started to face problem in using this word mainland. My idea is ki why should I call it mainland 
and why north east cannot be a mainland okay from my perspective it cannot be a mainland because i am not from north east uh, region but people who live in north east region for them it is their mainland right if i am going by the very literal meaning of what mainland should be and could mean so uh, i was thinking and this is this would be very insightful from your end if we can come up with some you know term an alternative to uh, to this mainland thing. whenever we refer to the central india north india south india we club them all together and we say mainland india right so do we have to do that is it necessary is it necessary from a policy perspective and is there an alternative this is a question that i would like to that's a task for the uh, for the session uh, tomorrow in the marginalization because i was i was bringing in the whole peripheral question so, okay. because it is uh, what what uh, ashley is implying is that when we refer <laughs> refer to the the people who are living in northeast india not just northeast india for instance uh, let's say that uh, if i say that i live in uh, maharashtra and i call that i i live in maharashtra and then i am a marathi and then uh, mainland india is you know it's mainland india it is it excluding maharashtra then it is actually uh, hold the fact that the the point we started with the self and then other question you are actually othering the self you have already when we say that i belong to northeast india but not the mainland india you are actually marginalizing the self you are marginalizing yourself so it is it is true that there are different contexts political contexts historical political contexts why north east india came into being as you said but then it is highly highly problematic even from that perspective only because you accept that marginalization that i do not belong or we the self doesn't belong to the mainland quote unquote but also from the uh, it's also much problematic from the mainland mainlanders perspective yes as coming i mean it is it is always you know again there's a acceptance that you know it is it is always alienating from the point of view of a mainlander it is it is very random i mean it's not like the mainland india is an identity no it's a diverse identity i mean yeah. it is there is no mainland it is india is the mainland yeah actually the whole concept started with uh, you know we are immune with that you know we are brought up with that yeah, we don't yeah. belong to the mainland yeah so, that no that is a political historical that's context right. that's very much so, there so it's like it's in the like we've been talking about this in the family once we are in school and once we go outside we have studied outside and i'm very sure most of us sitting here have studied outside and we have seen that Othering of the other, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like I went there with self. I'm trying to get in with others, but then once I go there, I feel that I'm, you know, that acceptance that acceptance uh, is not there. there. So it's, it's nothing like me as it is. This land is my land also. It's a main land for me. Yeah. Okay, Why are we not accepting? Yeah, because it's also our, our main land. Different. Our food habits is different. Our culture is different. <laughs> And for us, the Khasis will like Mediterranean society. Would totally different, okay? If you want to identify a person, how would you identify that person? If not from the way of of life, if not that he is a you know the the food habits that he is habituated to, then how would you identify that person? Obviously, it would be the other. Obviously, he's the other. Yeah, yeah, or she's the other. Yeah. Because that is what determines the identity of a person. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what I said. That you know the so whole idea of other person. ऑल माई सेल्फ अभिहार बिकॉज आई है 
that is coming, maybe that will not have any alienation because I am only identifying with a part of the world where I came from. If you call yourself Khasi or Garo, so you have a certain culture you have been born and you are identifying with that and you have your social identity is built across that. But uh, this is very problematic question not for the northeastern people but for the quote unquote mainlander people. Because wherever they call themselves mainland, they sort of end up unifying the central, north and south. Yeah. Then yeah. they unify everything. And they are only otherizing the north part. For no reason actually. Because it's like the 90 and the 10, you know? Yeah. So they're doing that. <laughs> Anyhow, like it's always yeah. 90 and the 10. Yeah. But then, uh, but like if, we are, if I call myself a north Indian, then there is no otherization again. I'm just saying I am from north. Yeah. There are other parts of it. It's just a geography, it's just a direction. Yeah. This mainland has that problem. Huh, but there is also the, the historical context. It has something to do with the, the what we are discussing here. The, the shifts or the evolution of the whole tribal policy specific to Northeast India will also reflect on this question very interestingly. Because see, it is the policy of isolation that had given that, that uh, identity. I mean, that's the root of the identity. That you are isolated because you need that protection. You have a different culture, different, uh, you know, uh, tradition and different way of uh, living. It was given. So the point that I said, you know, the, the, uh, the enlightenment about the self is something very much central to the whole question of identity. But at the same time, identity is also given by the other. So it translated through the policy. Now, the, where the problem lies, problem lies is that that policies became internalized and there is a sense of ownership. <coughs> now, I'm not ashamed of saying that I belong to certain tribe. There's a sense of uh, denial because, you know, it was given. Initially, it was given by the, by the, through the policies that it will be administered. You will need protection because you have different culture. Who said that you have different culture? It is the other who said different culture. Because different culture is different for the other only who came from Western world who had no idea about the Eastern world. Who had no idea about the tribal cultures in, in India, different type of tribal cultures in India. Again, when we say, when we talk about a tribal culture in India, it is also not a very, you know, homogenized kind of a culture. It is very diverse. Central India is completely diverse. Northeast India is completely diverse. You talk about Meghalaya itself is completely diverse. It's not just the Khasi, the Garos are there, the Jaintias are there. And it is also based on the reason. Look at the Assam. Assam is still struggling with the whole question of self-determination that again sprouted with the whole, you know, uh, the acceptance of the identity which is given by the other. Uh, by the small tribal communities. We have, the Assam has Borough Autonomous Council Territorial, uh, you know, uh, Council, which is the sixth scheduled territorial council. But then there are statutory tribal councils which are non-territorial, very interesting. It is not, there is no territory assigned to those autonomous councils. But they have voting, they have, uh, they have councils, they vote, they have elections and then they govern through in a random, the, I mean, uh, the, their community, for instance, missing autonomous council functions in the areas where missing people are living. So very interesting. From where that had come? This, this, this had come from the acceptance of the identity which was given. And also there's a lot of, uh, as ma'am has said very uh, correct, there's a policy of internalization, politics of internalization also. And there's a sense of, uh, I mean, uh, it, it also reflects in terms of policy. For instance, the whole, uh, when we'll be discussing the citizenship question, we'll be discussing the case of Assam because that's the only case uh, which uh, talks about this community identity and how it is translated into the law, change in the laws, the citizenship laws. Then we'll be talking that how this identity politics plays a very interesting role to get special attention from the, uh, within the larger structure of the constitution. Assam was given that special status, the ethno uh, status within the larger we of the constitution. It was only Assam who got that, uh, you know, uh, protection that uh, an illegal migrant, if a person comes to Assam, enters Assam, illegal immigrant, after the midnight of 24th uh, March, 
1971 from Bangladesh specific and if he or she enters to Assam, that person will be identified as illegal immigrant. But if that same person comes to Meghalaya, goes to uh, uh, Rajasthan, goes to Delhi, that person is not illegal immigrant, which is specific to Assam. So that's a, that's a identity politics, you know, that's the use of the nationality, you know, in the, you know, plays a very, very big role. We'll, we'll discuss that case later, uh, because in, in details we'll be discussing, we have a different session on that. that. Let's not go into that because it's, it's a very provocative, uh, you know, uh, topic anyways, and then we can go on and on. But then now coming back to the assimilation question, and I started to pull up, uh, thanks for the, that, that is the primary concern that, uh, the whole assimilation, the proposal of the assimilation was struck off, actually. It, it in fact faced more criticism than the policy of isolation. Assimilation started with, assimilation is also associated with uh, larger, you know, uh, debates around the questions like Sanskritization, civilization. I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sure that you have heard of Sanskritization. How many of you have? Any idea what is Sanskritization? Any anything random maybe? I mean, it is there in the word itself. As Pulak said, that it was expected in the whole policy of assimilation, there was a sense of letting go of the tradition and culture. It was expected that gradually they will assimilate, they will become one. It is not integration. You do not let, in integration, you do not let go of your language. You do not let go of your culture. What uh, uh, you were saying, what's your name, sorry? Dilshad. Dilshad. What Dilshad was saying, and also ma'am was uh, saying that we kind of protect, there's this, it is compartmentalized. The protection is also compartmentalized. The assimilation is also compartmentalized. We meet, we mix up to a certain extent, but then we do not mix up. We maintain a gap. That is, that, that was not the whole project, not the proposal of the assimilation at that stage, at the, this stage of policy intervention. So the policy of assimilation, it came with a larger idea of Sanskritization because Sanskritization proposes that the larger uh, model of India, Hindustan, which draws from the, the Sanskritic tradition, you know, you will, you will gradually, and which is also again has the root in the caste system, that you kind of Sanskritize yourself. And it also refers to the, I mean, there's a very interesting uh, uh, connotation, I mean, in, in everyday life, uh, we used to hard it when we were, uh, you know, um, young and then children. Uh, Sanskriti, the word Sanskriti was also very used in a very interesting way. It, it did not just refer to culture, it actually referred to civilization in a very interesting way. So caste system uh, has this idea that, you know, you can, you can climb up the ladder. There are different ways of, you know, uh, going up in the ladder, which is very difficult anyways. But then it was there and to bring in the tribal uh, communities to that particular ladder, the structure of the caste system, the Sanskritization was in a way used, not in an ideological plane, but in a practice level. And when this assimilation, the project of assimilation was floated, it was actually expected that one point of time we will become one, the culture would become one, the diversity will go away. Though Nehru was very much critical of this model. So that's why Nehru, Nehru had been always, you know, saying, but very interestingly, in a philosophical plane, in an ideological plane, when Mahatma Gandhi proposed the whole concept of Swaraj, then Gandhi also said that if you want to become an Indian in the new nation state India, you have to let go of yourself, the different, that diversity. But Nehru was of a dif different opinion. Nehru said that, the unity in diversity. So Nehru acknowledged very, very, uh, very significantly, I mean, very importantly, he had very categorically, he had acknowledged the diversity question. But then he said that these, these diverse people have to unite and make the, build the new nation state. 
So it was during the nation building uh, stage uh, when the assimilation, Nehru was not for it actually. Nehru was for protection. Nehru, okay, Nehru agreed with this whole idea of, uh, you know, schedule areas because of the fact that he believed that we need some sort of protection. The tribal people, they need communities, they need some sort of protection. But then he was not very much into the whole concept that gradually we will become one. That was not Nehru's concept. So immediately Nehru also intervened in a very, very interesting way. And then he proposed, which is again the other principle, the last principle at play is a policy of proposal of principle of integration. So integration is very much different than the what assimilation means. Nehru talks about, it's not moving. Okay. So then when the integration was proposed and then thought about, Nehru came up with these pansashil, which became the, the, uh, the basic of the present day ad of tribal administration in India. Though there are a lot of changes in the policy level, of course, there, there are new need uh, according to the, the changes in the need, changes of the political situations. But these are the guiding principles which Nehru had come up and then uh, he had he had proposed that we should place we should kind of build upon these uh, ideas and that is called panchashil i'm i'm sure that you also know about it but let's have some discussion on it because it talks about the larger uh, larger debates and which again reflects in the cad the um, you have that we are going to have a discussion on in the CED, well, while the tribal schedule areas were, you know, uh, designed uh, and it was going to the constitution, when the constituent assembly had a very animated and very lengthy and very interesting, uh, you know, uh, debate on this issue, these points were there, but then it was not concretized in the manner where the Nehru had, uh, you know, placed it after the policy of assimilation faced the criticism. So the first, uh, you know, point that it says that non-imposition, non-imposition. So what does it mean? The tribal people should develop along the lines of their own geni genesis and nothing should be imposed on that. What does it mean? But if you have a policy, for instance, the central government has a policy of uh, some health policy and it needs to be implemented in a uh, six schedule areas or the uh, six schedule states. But it has to implement. I mean, if the central government comes up with a policy, central policy, then it has to be implemented, right? But then what does this mean that non-imposition? Even that is an imposition. The central government has designed the policy. It is not the state government. But then it anyways reflects it. It is implemented in the, in the state level, even in the six schedule areas. So when we do that in practice, is it not an imposition? But Nehru was against that imposition. But it was not constitutional again. It is not legal. These are the ideological platforms. I mean, these are the ideological points that Nehru said that suggested that we should build upon the, the tribal policies. So what does, what the first point could mean? Can anyone reflect? <laughs> uh, like the six sheet was being brought in the six sheet rule, the, the powers were given to the autonomous district councils to make laws and to use their own genius <coughs> and their own cultures to protect their own cultures to their own genius. Hmm. This was it's like non imposition, nothing is imposed on them. The central laws are not imposed on the tribal people, so they were allowed, they were given the freedom uh, without any anything imposed on them to uh, protect their cultures and to educate their own children. Yeah, but then, um, as I said that, for instance, uh, there's a national uh, rural health mission uh, policy. I'm just giving an example, random example. So it's a health policy, which was to be implemented in all parts of India. It's a national policy. It's a mission. So then how do you do it? Is it not an imposition? I'm just trying to float. Huh. Uh, I never different uh, uh, opinion about it. Because I actually work on a health project. So uh, we have something like uh, health insurance scheme. Okay, so central government, although gives it the broad regulations, but 
that's called the parent regulation. And the state which uh, the state has the flexibility to carve out their own policy out of that parent act, which in a sense is not imposition, the center is giving a lot of flexibility as well, <coughs> so that the states can innovate as per the context, geography, and uh, all the other variables, mm. right? Mm. So they have that flexibility. Mm. Although you may say that uh, they are imposing the parent act, but that's the idea of that insurance scheme, right? Mm. So that is called uh, at the uh, central level, the insurance scheme is uh, that. Uh, uh, but here it is called MHIS, mm. Mm. health insurance. Mm. It has all the components of the central government, but it is. Uh, attuned to the uh, 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 requirements of the state. Okay. So that's been done already. Yeah, yeah. No, but my question is a little different. I mean, what I'm trying to <coughs> ask is that what do you mean by what does this point, uh, you know, mean by non imposition then? We are trying to justify the impositions. I mean, this is not imposition. Actually, we are saying it is not imposition. Very interesting. But then, what is non imposition then? Uh, it means the cultural beliefs or the customs. If you talk about non imposition, you have the. When we are talking about Sanskritization, it's the concept of the Aryan Brahmo, uh, not the Brahmo, the Brahmin Aryan. Brahmanical, yeah. Brahmanical concept. So, non imposition would mean here the customs and culture in the tribal areas, they have their own unique custom, culture, religion, practices, traditions, everything. So non imposition would mean not letting the main laws or not letting laws train in that manner that would eradicate those customs and practices. Thanks. Yeah, that's a very, very significant point. Yeah, maybe you want to add something? No, actually it's just striking me about non imposition, of course, but uh, indirectly, say for example, at her employment. Hmm. Which is a big human and cry in mm. India. Yeah. In one way, they say it is not compulsory, mm -hmm. but in another way, it has become so compulsory that you will not get ration, mm -hmm. you will not get attention, <coughs> you have to wait and update. So, in one way, you're saying it's not imposed, mm. but indirectly, it is so much imposed that, uh, I mean, at least from the social. Uh, welfare point of view, we saw that there are many social welfare schemes, mm. which of course we say that we will not impose it, but finally at the end of the day, it is imposing. So in a in policy NRM, level? In NRM, it's, it's another thing. If not uh, from NRM, then you can always get it from other source. But when it comes to Aadhaar thing, what I notice here is that it has really become an imposition which you really impose on people. Yeah, so what you were trying to say, as I think with her uh, uh, insights, what's your name, sorry? Trishna. Trishna, with Trishna's insight is that there is also a sense of imposition in a policy level. It is not like that the policies are always objective and then very scientifically implemented according to the need of the geography. It is not always like that. There is a sense of imposition in the policy level also. But then what uh, she added and then what Nehru was trying to broadly, so Nehru had uh, said it in a very, very political, you know, way. This, this saying is very political. I mean, he did not, Nehru did not uh, point it out that it is in a policy level. Or Nehru did not point it out in a cultural level, but it is, it is as if at that point of time, as if it was more indicative of the, the culture and the tradition. But when, uh, as ma'am said, when it comes to the culture and the traditional context, for instance, I missed out on a very, very significant point at the beginning. Sorry for that, but it was there in the, in the PPT. For instance, let us think of the when the colonial policies started, there's a very, very significant role of the missionaries, the Christian missionaries. So then when you talk of the culture, when you talk of the tradition, because once the religion is changed, once there's a conversion happening in the tribal areas, it's a complete shift of the culture or it, it becomes a hybrid culture. So then uh, that policy was that intervention, the intervention of the missionaries were very much, you know, um, evident at that point of time uh, in, the, in the colonial, with the colonial policies, the tribal policies. This is deep rooted uh, 
even till today. Yes. So it, it's a very, for instance, I'll, I'll give you this example in, uh, this is a very interesting example from my own ancestral village. My village has uh, three uh, tribal communities. One is outside the revenue village, but then uh, they're very much in, you know, uh, in connection with the leave, in connection with the rest of the communities. So in my revenue village, there are three tribal communities. One is the Deuri tribal community, and this is uh, missing tribes, and then uh, Thai Khamti, there's a settlement of the Thai Khamti uh, village. It was done by the Britishers because they were shifted from Sadia. There was a very uh, huge conflict happening, uh, confrontation happening with the Britishers, so they could not handle them. So they kind of, you know, re relocated them in different parts so that, you know, it's a divide and rule kind of a policy. So they, they became a part of their Buddhists. So they have a, their own way of uh, leaving. In the other part, in the revenue village of Panbari, there's a caste settlement, which is different caste Hindu, Asmi speaking caste Hindu peoples. So it's a larger settlement area. There's an area, uh, there's a settlement area of the missing people. And there's a dead river. It's an abundant river by the river Dikrong. So across that river, that dead stream, there's a, uh, another community, which is a, a huge village of the Dewri uh, tribal community. They, they're there. Now, uh, the missing settlement area is the smallest one. So they do not speak the, the language, the missing, I, I do not call it a dialect. It is it is language. I mean, they do not write it. They do not have script. Now they have a uh, script. I mean, they have adopted the uh, the the Hindi script is called uh, Devanagari script. So they have started writing, but it is a, it is a language. I mean, they 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 speak, so it's a language. So then uh, they do not speak the language, the missing language. But then they uh, they they speak. Uh, Assamese in a very different way. I mean, they, in their way, they speak the Assamese and then they, they come in, commute. And then uh, they have two simultaneous religious practices. One is they are the worshippers of the Donipolo, the moon and the sun, because they are the descendant from the hill tribes of uh, Arunachal Pradesh, uh, which is called Miri tribes originally, but they do not refer, they do not prefer to call themselves Miri at this point. So they, they refer themselves to uh, as uh, missing. So they they worship sun and then moon, Donipolo, and then they entered into the process of Sanskritization and then they became disciples of the Sankardeva's Vaishnav, uh, you know, the religion that which, which Assam is, you know, uh, it's predominant in Assam. So they have a Namghar, which is the prayer hall, which is the Vaishnav uh, Mandir. And then, uh, I mean, prayer community hall. It is also a community hall. It is not just a prayer hall. And also they have a place as just next to that where they worship uh, this uh, Donipolo. So they have a two simultaneous thing at the same level. And what, what is happening in the Majuli is that most of them, the missing same community people, they have converted into Christian. But... They have, whenever there is a marriage, they will have two rituals. One is according to the church and then another is according to their tradition. And they also worship Donipolo. They go to the church. They have become Christian. They have, I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge conversion happened very recently. But then they do worship Donipolo uh, together. So these kind of imposition, I mean, it's a very political imposition. When the missionaries came, they came with a, promise of, they came with a promise of philanthropy. They came with a policy of social welfare, right? That will do the welfare. That was a promise of welfare. But in the, it, in the process, because it was a highly, highly political thing. I mean, the missionaries had reached into the places where the administration could not. I mean, they, it was, a, and also very interestingly, the whole modern culture in Northeast India is actually it is attributed to the interventions of the missionaries. For instance, the the quote unquote the mainstream Asmi script or Asmi's writing, the language which is spoken and written by the the caste Hindu Asmi speakers. Now it is actually the contribution of the missionaries. I mean they had standardized the language in, in the valleys of Assam. 
So, uh, and also for, for instance, the tribes, uh, for, for, for instance, the case of Mijoram and then uh, Nagaland, also the case of Meghalaya, it is, it is completely, the, there's a lot of, you know, contributions in, in that sense that, you know, but it is, it is a contribution towards bringing in the different communities, diverse communities. Uh, towards the modernization, the process of modernization, which is again the Western form of Sanskritization. It is very Brahmanical in nature. It is very, very patriarchal in nature. It's a highly political in nature, but it is hidden. And that is, that is very much can be called as imposition. Nehru was against it, of course, in a larger level. And also the policy level also, Nehru said that we should not push them to the larger policy structure of India. But that is not explicit. Yeah. So ma'am, uh, if you can help with the idea of <coughs> Nehruvian idea of non-imposition because they shall give an example from the policy perspective that there is a parent policy which is directive in nature and states or the autonomous districts are allowed to form within the ambit of that policy <coughs> their own regulations and how they are going to implement it, their program and their uh, methods to it. So, it is, uh, like you said, justifying imposition in the sense that there is a parent and you have the freedom and yet you have to act Implement. within the umbrella of it. So, there is a very covert way of imposing, right? Then there is, uh, there was another example mentioned uh, uh, from the policy perspective, ma'am mentioned about Aadhaar. You, uh, Aadhaar is not compulsory. For a lot Aadhaar of is compulsory. I, I will we'll talk about it in a it's citizen so that's why I didn't go. But yeah. like in a lot of, uh, I mean I'm not saying, uh, my uh, idea was that Aadhaar is uh, not compulsory for a lot of, like for identification for that matter. Aadhaar is not something that you need to have. You have to have. No, but when there are that No, 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 no. The whole, uh, the shift in the citizenship law is actually the intervention of the Aadhaar. We'll be discussing it. It's a, Aadhaar is going to be compulsory. It, it is compulsory, actually. It was about to become compulsory. Uh, so, while I was before joining here uh, in 2018, when I passed out on BLLP, I joined Supreme Court and this is the case with the Dubai government. And I was working and researching how to not make it mandatory, Aadhaar not making it mandatory. No, but like my knowledge is that it is not yet mandatory. <coughs> it is mandatory in the social way because so much capital, political and social capital have been attached to it uh, that it has become mandatory. Like yeah. you banks, you need to. Uh, you have to have you. You have to connect uh, your like accounts. Exactly. So these are the other operational ways in which you make it mandatory. These huh? are these are the moldings. These are the moldings. Yeah, that is what I was going to say, that there are so many uh, ways in which you make something mandatory in the in the covert, in the in the covert operations, in the indirect way. Then there is there is there was an example of culture like the uh, Christian missionaries. So they came and the uh, operative word is penetration. They come with their culture and they penetrate a certain society with the promise of philanthropy. They give certain things and it's open for people. Like if you like it, charity. Join yeah, it. charity is the word. Yeah. Yeah, charity is the word. But with, the, with in, in the course of time, so much social capital gets attached, and so many people are uh, now belonging to that. Then it it sort of becomes a cultural imposition in the long run, even if it is not a cultural imposition in the short run, even if there is no iota of imposition uh, in in any direct manner. So in a direct manner, everything is indirect. So. Uh, there is imposition which is very direct and it's visible to the eyes. Then there is imposition which is not visible, like you were mentioning, hidden ways. And then for those ways, there is justification attached. Like this is not imposing because we are doing it in a hidden way. But then what is non-imposition in itself? That's what that's what I wanted. That is and that's a what how do we understand the whole question of non-imposition? Because everywhere it is imposition. I mean, yeah. direct or the indirect way it is imposition. But what is non-imposition? That's why I said that this is a very political and it's a very, uh, I mean, it, it is placed or set by the Nehru in a very, very political way. He well, didn't... Vague. Is it vague? No, it is, it is political. That's why it is vague. I want to bring it from an example of Westernization. Yeah, please. Westernization, McDonaldization. Uh, McDonaldization, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's wearing jeans now. It's not imposed, but people realize it. 
Yeah. That is the attachment of social capital. Nah? You see people wearing jeans. So again, we are going into no directions because it. People in the lower class, they want to go to the higher class. Yeah. They want to copy everything. In this context, what I'm trying to understand is strong and position often is not having to give up anything of what you already have or what you already practice in. That's a very interesting point. Yeah, um, you don't yeah. have to give it up. You're protected enough, but then you yourself you don't have to give it up. There's no policing of what you have to do, what you have to wear, what you have to eat, or anything like that. Uh, yeah, no, that's what uh, that's what Trishna had uh, said that you know it's the, like broadly it is said as culture as as tradition. Uh -huh. Yeah, so do not uh, impose upon the culture. But then uh, the the conversation with the intervention of uh, Ashwini's uh, very insightful uh, intervention is that it it is actually bringing us into the whole question of the political economy of the time. Also, Pulaks. I mean, the we cannot escape the larger politics of the the political economy. You are you are still there. I mean, haha. -ha. Yeah, but that is that's very simplistic, and then that's very that's what apparently Nehru said. But then I, what I'm yeah no because it could not work that way because it is it is not outside the purview of the. Uh, like, uh, for instance, here we do not have the VRI, Panchayati Raj. Mm, mm, we have only the door mm. And there are certain schemes where the central government uh, has passed on. Yes. Yeah. To the VRI. Yeah, yeah. In the model of the Panchayat. Yes, yes, yes. But yes. We yeah, but in central India, for instance. But we never imposed on us that we should constitute the Panchayat. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. That happened in PESA. What happened in the central India with the other tribal communities, the fifth scheduled tribal I mean, communities, uh, the PESA was introduced. So, anyways, the panchayat is, I mean, somewhere or the other, you are, the decentralization is also a very centralizing, uh, you know, state there. It's a very higher centralizing idea. So, my, uh, my intervention was just to know from the cohort, is non-imposition which Nehru said, is it a positive word or a negative word? If it is a negative word, it just means the absence of imposition. If there is no imposition, it's not imposition. But is it a positive word? Does it mean something in itself? Not the absence of something, but the presence of something. Is this yes, yes, we, we need an answer. Yeah, I would love to have an answer on this. No, I don't thanks, know. thanks. There's a very thin line in between <laughs> 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 yeah, no, integrate, integrate, because this is a principle of integration. Uh, anyways, we, we, we leave the answer, we float the uh, question and then we leave it here so that we can move ahead. Yeah, yeah. we should. Yeah. The question comes very, uh, in my mind when I take this uh, example of Garbash now, so if we talk about the clients of non-imposition, imposition, ship schedule recognizes the village codes, the Darbar mm -hmm. law. Actually, if it is recognized by the constitution itself, why can not the schemes of Panchayati Raj be parallelly applied to Darbar law? Like, see, you give parallel recognition to the Panchayati Raj because okay, Panchayati Raj is the, if this is going to be very thin, politically incorrect work, the mainstream uh, mainstream policy. Yeah, policy. Yeah, policy. Yeah. But because you are not impos imposing something on the uh, six schedule areas, you are recognizing their form of government by the uh, their form of government as the uh, cognit cognizable government or the legal government. So why not parallel if it is applied for that Organization. Why not parents being affected by this organization? That's again a very, very, very problematic question to ask uh, and also to address uh, because. The Bashkam does not want to accept it. No, because yeah. they are not elected members. Yeah. They are not elected, yes. they elected, they elected and they, they don't want to accept <coughs> it because they think that by accepting it, certain imposition again mm. and certain uh, restrictions will be there in the way they. <coughs> 
And this whole idea was, I mean, how do you float that idea? That's the thing because this denial is already there and exclusion is already there. It, you are already within the sixth due. So you are ex excluded already. <coughs> so that question doesn't arise and it's a very, I mean, it's a, you can ask this question. I mean, I think we can take her, she should include the question for the the later sessions when yeah. we have uh, reflection. Actually, this question will also pop up in the citizenship debate. Yes. Yeah. So, it's a very good question, but it's a problematic question to ask. And then we do not know how to ask and then where to ask. And who will ask? For instance, as ma'am said, that there's always, a, and already the denial is there. And also the state has assured that it is not going to come. Right? So, even if vaguely it was there, that it could be parallel, but then how it can be parallel? You you have already given that right to self determination. You know, have to have the self rule. So then we do not want any alternative system. The structure is but no panchayat is also. No, no, no. Again, again, it is it is embedded in the structure. And interestingly, the panchayat is uh, the whole structure of the panchayat. It's it's, a, it's based on the caste system. So in tribal societies, the if you ask the policy, the embeddedness of the larger uh, policy philosophies, then it cannot be in tribal societies. I mean, that's anyways excluded, right? But yeah, I mean, in the course of evolution, maybe that could be a question which she can she can but include. Can make a note of the question. Yeah. In the later sessions, we have a practice like you propose, you ask the questions and then, you know, uh, try to find some solution to it. So maybe we can have that practice later. Yeah. So coming to the other other points, uh, the first point, the non-imposition uh, and then what uh, Trishna has said and then we had a discussion on is that about the culture and then tradition, there's the respect for the tribal custom. The second one try, kind of support the, the vagueness of the try to justify the vagueness, uh, which is political again, uh, to the non-imposition. So it particularly mentions about the customs, which is very easy to say again, which is again political. And that will also, uh, you know, we'll bring in when we have a discussion on citizenship and CIA and CA, uh, I mean, uh, CAB and then CA. The third point is development of tribal youth. That is very, very crucial. Tribal youth be trained and a team of their own people should be built to do the work of administration and development. Okay, so now let us go back to the imposition question. I mean, how, how problematic you find them? I'm not, I'm not saying already that it is problematic, but then how can you imagine that you, you it's not... Because it, it directly saying that tribal youth should be trained. Very strong sentence. <coughs> what does the training mean? It is already, it was already accepted, implied that the tribal youth need to be trained. Is it not an imposition in a very direct way? direct intervention why we need to get trained i mean this is a very very larger philosophical question for the discipline of anthropology also we have been trying to handling it and then of course anthropology has come a long way and then it, it has evolved into a very different kind of a discipline but then it was central to the whole discipline that why we should study the others let them be the other if if they're other for you then you know they're the tribal people they have their own ways of you know living they have their own cast custom as said the respect to tribal customs so they when we when we say for instance here comes the whole question of customary law what is customary law law people what is customary law But we say that, but when it is said that modification, yeah, yeah, codification, codification of the 
traditional uh, rules and laws. Okay. Not rules and raw, laws. Law. Yeah, that becomes customary law. Okay. Like the Hindu marriage. Okay. Or like just customs. But once it has got the essence of law, mm -hmm. then it became Hindu marriage or law. Okay. Uh, I'll give you a situation here. Um, Again, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it from my own uh, observation, from my own society, because it, it is, anyways, you know, it, it is, I know it, so, and it is an experiential kind of a learning and also a very close observation. So, uh, let me draw from there. <clears throat> the Namgar, the pair hall in Assam, they actually work as court, the customary court. There are a lot of interesting, uh, you know, cases which were never registered with the police and which were dissolved in the court, I mean, the Namghar, which is the presence of the society. So it is a community hall, basically. So then uh, there were rape cases, there were murder cases, which were solved in Namghar at the presence of the whole society. And there's a very interesting word in Assam, which is which calls uh, excommunicated, you cannot come to the community hall. When a person is excommunicated, he is or she cannot come to the community hall and it is a punishment actually. So when you defy the rules and regulations, which is traditional, which has no codification, which is not codified, they are, uh, if you break them, then you are punished. You cannot become a part of the or take part in the everyday life of the community. You cannot come to the community hall and all. And such cases, gross violation of the law in the modern law system, like murder, like rape cases, like lot more, like land disputes, these were solved in, in Namghar, right? But now, when, now at the present day context, when there's a murder in the, in the same village, it will first go to the police intervention. I mean, police will intervene, right? But then colonial government, what colonial government did is like, it was very easy to bring in the criminal uh, cases like murder, like rape, like uh, the theft, like decoity, to, you know, bring in the pursuit of the modern law. But it was very difficult for them to bring in the laws or the, uh, or the uh, not laws, the customs of the different diverse tribal societies, communities, to bring into the, the standard, you know, uh, structure of the modern law which was very non-Western, right? So what did, do, what did they do is that they came up with the whole question of whole uh, proposal of the customary law. But here the problem is, once the custom is codified, as Pulak has said, it becomes law. So customary laws, which are supposedly to be independent of the modern law system, which were given the respect of follow the you know, continue with the customs of the communities, they were codified. They became law. It's a customary law. So again, there's a very interesting intervention, imposition here, that you, you do not bring in directly to the structure, but then you are actually making them law. So there is a very uh, existing debate, very, very interesting debate when the PESA was introduced in a central, uh, you know, India, how the traditional customary law and the positions within the customary laws are conflicting. And then the tribal, various tribal communities are claiming, disowning the customary law, criticizing that it's a colonial construct and it is not the tribal laws or it is not the tribal customs that we had to kind of, you know, have a understanding of the social deviations. Yeah, that is the reason it is codified. The whole point is being codified is to just bring uniformity. Because with the, with the generations as it is changing, laws, the whole idea of the customary laws, the 100 years back is totally different from the yeah. laws if it is not codified. Yeah. So just to bring uniformity and to uh, regularize it, and to, you know, routinize it. Yeah. So, so non-imposition is actually very imposing here. 
and very evident that with the the customary laws are evolving with the, the whole evolving evo evolution of the the standard the modern law system exactly like you see now people they go to the police station instead of going to the alarm clock why because because right. because it that 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 political step which was which was actually very you know cleverly done by the colonial government and the government of india also continued the self rule also continued with that colonial practices that you know uh, you the first sentence <laughs> that's very interesting that you respect the custom you codify the custom it becomes law it becomes uh, the mainstream quote unquote the mainstream the words the loose words which are very meaningful here to use and then the next point says that is this is the this is the problem of the whole proposal that you develop the whole prob question of development that you throw that you know development of the tribal youth as if there it was already implied it was already thought that they were not developed so here there are two points so the first is that tribal youth were not developed so here the whole uh, proposition of development is the western model of development because it was the whole entire country the new nation state of india as i said that after world war 2 what the other colonies which kind of you know declined and then became new nation state they did not bring in their own system of governance it was actually duplicating the western model of you know governance and then there were lot of vague and political promises to the to the you know the customs like local traditions that they will incorporate them they will give them the uh, the the self determination the right to self determination maintain their custom maintain their culture and it's very easy to say that you wear your own dress that's all fine we are not going to intervene there you follow your own religion you follow your own custom but at the deeper level what was happening and what had been happening what has been happening is that it's like you actually bring in to the larger model of the state so it is not it was never beyond the state it is never beyond the state and it has been something like that always so there's a very conflicting you know principles on which the entire model of tribal administration today is dwelt is embedded in and the fourth point is the simplicity of administration again there is a proposal of administration but it is you know it's simple okay let it be it is simple but who defines this simplicity what is the definition of simplicity here that you do not make it make it complex but does it mean that uh, also very interestingly tribal societies when they are referred as primitive societies they are also referred as simple societies very interesting but as as i said that it was very difficult for the britishers to bring in the the tribal customs into one unified you know western model of codified law because it was very diverse it was very complex because social system the whole structure in a tribal uh, society it is not simple it is complex in a very different way which is which is not sim which is not uh, you know um i mean which is complex in a different way and which is not the structure of the complexity in the western world they understand complex in a different way that is a understanding of the western society but tribal societies though they are referred as simple societies they are not simple at all they have their own structure of complexity it is different it is just different and they it was not i mean the the colonial government were they were not being able to understand that complexity so that's why they referred it to simple and then they they thought that it will leave it like that and then we we try to do certain sort of bargain and then try to intervene in a different way but then we'll call it a you know that that thing you know that separate uh, attitude but then it is this principle when it said that simplicity of administration it's again highly highly problematic and very very political that will keep the administration simple like as you said that why panchayatiras cannot be a part of it because they wanted to uh, continue with a simple structure of administration but is it simple and we can reflect from from the case of meghalaya itself i mean when it is a six scheduled state there are a lot of complex political relationships between the councils and then the state government 
and we know that's that's happening i mean it's a, it's a lot of complex relationship it is not just homogenized model of administration and specifically in the tribal areas i mean schedule uh, six schedule tribal areas for instance the case of borderland uh, assam government and the, the the equation the dynamics the political dynamics be between the government of assam and then the borderland uh, territorial autonomous council is very interesting i mean it is not simple it is very complex and also the the relationship between the statutory tribal autonomous councils you know that is very very complex because it is not territorial first of all who will vote is imposed there is a case of conflict in the uh, in the village which i have been constantly <coughs> referring that the caste uh, caste hindu population they were also included within the 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 voter list of the missing dairy autonomous missing missing and dairy autonomous council elections and they denied to vote because they are caste uh, people but as the territory was not defined and it was one village one revenue village their names were there of course they did not vote but there is a conflict i mean uh, there was a killing also in the in a sense i mean the, on the day of the election uh, there was a sort of very very hostile situation which was happening so it is not at all simple the tribal administration is never simple though the principle was there that it is will make the administration simple uh the third point is the emphasis on human growth now again another variable which is very much you know uh, a part of the makes it variable within the de whole development model western development model is the whole concept of human growth how do you measure it first of all and what do you even mean